the uh, Human Resources Committee meeting of the uh, Heart Board together. Uh, first, uh, to order. And the uh, first order of business is uh, Barbara. Yeah. You're here to give public testimony. Please do. I'll get it. I'll get it, Gordon. I got it. Good morning. Um, I reserved the right to testify to afterwards, but there's only really one thing on the agenda, which is the executive director's annual performance evaluation. Um, I just want to uh, test, oh, Barbara Armantrout, I'm a commissioner on the rate commission, but I'm speaking as an individual. I just want to say since Anthony's been at the helm, um, it's finally working the way it should be, I think behind the scenes. <laughs> so I wanted to put in my support for him and I'm glad that uh, we got him as our CEO. And um, and that's about it right now. The rest is up to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. And I, I believe you said Anthony, but I think you meant Andrew or Andy. Andrew, right? I'm sorry, yeah. Thank you. Just <laughs> too, early, right. too early in the morning, no coffee yet. <laughs> I understand. Okay. All right, thank you, Barbara. Um, next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from the February 22nd meeting, 2018 meeting of the Human Resource Committee. Um, has everybody had a chance to review them? Yes. Move to accept. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. Thank you. Um, as Barbara noted, we uh, alluded to, we have this morning uh, our agenda review um, evaluation of, uh, of the CEO and executive director's uh, performance. And um, the board may enter into executive session pursuant to Hawaii Revised Statute Section 92-4 and subsection 92-5A2 to consider the higher evaluation, dismissal, or discipline of an officer or an employee or of charges brought against the officer employee whose consideration of matters affecting privacy will be involved. And subsection 92-5A4 to consult with its attorneys on questions and issues on a matter pertaining to the board's powers, duties, privileges, immunities, and liabilities. As such, since this involves evaluation, I'd like would entertain a motion to, uh, to go into executive session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none. We're, we'll be moving to executive session. Thank you.
the uh, HR committee meeting back to order. Um, the committee met in executive session. We discussed process, timetable, and um, successfully accomplished a uh, full fair discussion of that. And having completed our business, no other items being on the agenda, um, I would entertain a motion to... Uh, Chair. Uh, I'm sorry, the, 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 we, uh, and part of what we decided is that we need to continue the meeting until uh, October 31st um, at 10.30. Um, also, for the record, meeting will be held here as, as it is today. Gee, am I missing anything else? <laughs> Gee, somebody else wants to. Uh, I would also note that I was, uh, I was negligent in not re clearing for the record that there was a misprint in terms of the date uh, and, uh, of this meeting. It was initially put out as being Thursday, October 19th, and I hope that didn't throw anybody off when, obviously, it's Friday, October 19th. And with that said, I think, I think I've covered everything, and if so, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I'd uh, rather to, uh, well, continue, continue the meeting until uh, October 31st. <clears throat> Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That, thank you. We're, we are continued. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, the meeting of the Transit-Oriented Development Committee of the Hart Board should come to order. It is Friday, October 19. Uh, members, this is the first TOD meeting we've had uh, as in a long time. And as you can see, the minutes that we're looking at is from March 16, 2017. That was before my time. But uh, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, this is a landmark meeting, I think, uh, because we actually have something to do. And I intend to hold TOD committee meetings um, in conjunction with every board meeting we have for November 15th and our December meeting, because we actually have a lot to, be do to get done uh, in preparation of the second phase of the P3 uh, specifications, and I'll explain more about that later. So, before we get started um, with the formal presentation, should I ask for public testimony on any of the agenda items? Thank you, Barbara. Please come up. I got it all. Thanks. Uh, Barbara Armantrout, I'm a commissioner on the rate commission, but I'm speaking as an individual. I just want to testify right now because I have a 1015 handy van, uh, and so I'll have to leave early, but I do have the, the uh, uh, I do have the handouts. Um, I just wanted to um, say that um, I just want to wish anybody going to Railvolution this next week that you'll learn a lot. I went last year on a scholarship and I'm going to try to go again next year because it's in Vancouver. So uh, there's a lot to learn TOD there. Um, and um, it's everything. You're mixed in with the whole United States. So it's very interesting. And I know Ember Shin went last year. We were there together. So you'll learn a lot. In fact, the first time you're going, it's like the next time will know how to really do everything. But the first time you're walking around, where do I go, what do I do? But it's very, very interesting. Okay, Thank bye. Thank you. I just hope that you're sending the right people going because you got the 44 million. So now people are really looking to where you're spending the money. Anybody else want to testify before we get started? Okay, seeing no one. Um, I want to thank um, Harrison Rue and Ryan. Who's last? Tam. <laughs> Tam, thank you. My brain just went on a uh, <laughs> stalled here. For putting this presentation together on short notice, I know they worked really hard uh, to meet my demanding time frames. We met a couple of times in preparation uh, to sort everything out, and I really appreciate their efforts. I also appreciate Andy's efforts. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I also appreciate Andy's efforts because he's been very supportive of TOD, and I'm told that I have to approve the minutes first. So I don't. So, okay. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Was anyone in attendance at this meeting? <laughs> Terrence. Okay. You're the only one actually who can vote. No, John, no. <laughs> I mean, you John. can all, oh, John, John, John. okay, great, okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Okay. Uh, we have on speakerphone the Ernst & Young folks. Uh, Harrison and Ryan are going to be giving an overview of the Ernst & Young study on TOD, which was separately commissioned by the city in conjunction with ENY's uh, analysis of the of the P3, and uh, and they we've also added other things for the discussion today. So um, who's on the phone? We may Adam need to. Christian. Anybody else? That's it. Hi. Good morning. You have Chi and Mai as well from EY. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Harrison Ryan. Go ahead. Thank. Thank you. Um, and we will wait and see if we have any questions for them. Tui and Mai led the overall rail P3 infrastructure study, and Adam Christian led the real estate portion that we'll be talking about today. Okay, thank you. 
Um, we're going to quickly just a uh, very slight overview of the city's TUD program so we see where Hart uh, properties fit into that. We'll present the summary of the, the P3 TOD analysis that was conducted in parallel with the rail analysis this spring. That includes a look at both potential real estate revenues and ancillary revenues, you know, concessions and advertising and parking, things like that. And uh, I'll hand it over to Ryan to talk about near-term opportunities on the heart-owned, heart-controlled properties. And then uh, uh, we'll turn it over to Chair Shin to talk about the policy issues at the end. Um, Honolulu's TOD program is fairly mature under leadership of uh, Acting Director and Committee Member Sokugawa. They've been working on the TOD plans and policies for about 11 years now. Yeah, I think Kathy just said forever. <laughs> it's been more than a decade and a lot of community involvement, but it's uh, pretty mature. There's uh, focused on high density mixed use development near the rail stations. A lot of TOD planning and community outreach, countless meetings in every one of the rail areas with the public, with developers, businesses. Um, we're working on rezoning the lands around each station with added height and density available. It's, we're turning out to be very attractive to developers, focusing on infrastructure plans and investments, complete streets, finance tools and incentives, focus on uh, building a few catalytic projects, coordinating with the mayor's affordable housing strategy and investments. Our secret weapon is the mayor's TOD sub cabinet, which was actually first uh, convened by uh, committee Chair Shin when she was Managing Director and that was uh, probably the Ember, uh, was probably the smartest thing you did when you were at the city to get that group together and, and, and knock heads and get everybody to work together because it's a very effective way to make decisions together and coordinate. And then the new kid on the block is the state's interagency TOD Council which the legislature uh, convened a couple of years ago and they're doing a TOD strategic plan for the state properties as a landowner. And there's you know tremendous potential there. Uh, the vision, I think anybody, and Barbara, if you went to Rail Evolution, uh, anybody kind of knows what the vision is. It's, it's shared with a lot of places: walkable, healthy, age-friendly neighborhoods, connect people with where they need to go. What's most important here in Honolulu, since they're one city and county, we want to make sure that each station area has their own unique identity. Waipahu is different from Kali, he's different from East Kapolei or Ala Moana. That the scale of development, um, as allowed by the codes, really fits with that community's context. And we want our investments to help revitalize those older communities as well. Um, quick map, you're used to looking at this as a rail map, but uh, this is the map of the TOD plans and plan areas. Um, one of the smartest things was to decide we don't need 21 plans for 21 stations. So there's eight plans in the city portion and then HCDA plan covers two stations. Half of the plans are adopted for Waipahu, Aya Pearl City, Kali and downtown in Chinatown. Um, two of them, the Halava area for the stadium is at city council for approval as well as Ala Moana neighborhood TOD plan. And we're getting ready to introduce the airport plan pretty soon. Um, there is more than uh, probably this much, you know, several inches worth of documents for each planning station area, existing conditions, plans, codes, action plans. So a tremendous amount of resources at honolulu.gov slash TOD if anybody wants to follow up on these. Um, one of the things that sets us apart nationally when you, when you look at what other cities have to do, since we are one city county, we have the same rules everywhere. So it, most rail places are in multiple jurisdictions. Developers have to know different rules for each city, county, suburb. Um, this is one set of entitlements. Um, one of the smartest things that uh, Director Sokugawa and the city council did was to adopt this interim plan development transit permit about uh, four years ago. That allows developers with a 20,000 square foot lot some of the hard parcels would, would qualify for that, not all of them, um, to get a flexible permit within a, about six or seven months that allows them to develop um, and get a, added height and density even before the TOD zoning is adopted. And we've, City Council has approved five projects in Ala Moana for that already, fairly large towers, lo uh, most of them include affordable housing. Um, there's one more at Council right now. So that is a tremendous advantage to be able to, to have that. 
There's a special district overlay that includes the rules. It's not fussy. It doesn't get into <coughs> architecture or paint colors. It's about the form and function. You know, is the building close to the street? About two thirds of it has to have doors and windows and active uses. Reduces the parking requirements. Um, that has been adopted for the whole rail corridor, but it only applies where the TOD zoning map is adopted, which is Wapaho and Westlock right now. The TOD zoning, this is the map of Westlock. It's again adopted. It allows, you know, the red is BMX mixed use, the purple is industrial mixed use, the um, tan color is apartment mixed use. Those, you basically, once it's adopted, you don't have to go through rezoning. But if you look very closely, there's a parentheses after the height. So you automatically, in, in the case of the red there, get 60 feet of height, but you can go up to 90 feet of height if you provide some community benefits. Um, and uh, I think we're getting ready to introduce the Pearl City IA within the next couple of months. We did uh, an assessment of the, essentially the easy, relatively easy to develop properties in each area. And there's roughly 50,000 units of fairly easy to develop. It's either uh, vacant land, uh, parking lots, a small non-historic building, or you know places that are, are not high value. Uh, so there's tremendous development potential. Um, there's actually significantly more development potential than that once the market has, has used up some of this. This is just a glance of what Eva Lay development would look like and you can see it's mostly centered around the main road corridors, around the rail stations. We've also uh, looked at the TOD infrastructure needs along the entire corridor. Um, Andy, we were talking the other day, this 1.5 billion in planned TOD infrastructure investments does not even include the hundreds of millions of dollars that you're spending to repair and improve the infrastructure as part of the guideway construction. So there's a probably, you know, significantly more than that. Um, about two thirds of this money is kind of programmed in long-term city investments, but uh, we need additional money to complete the rest of these. So particularly in Eva Lake Apalama area, working on a finance district, we're working closely with the state and their consultant to look at that together. Um, so that's all we're gonna say about the city's existing TOD program. It's pretty mature focused uh, and uh, you know, ready to help developers deliver projects, which would include working with HART on any TOD on your properties. Um, so I'm gonna just quickly summarize the TOD revenue analysis. Um, uh, Ernst & Young worked with their sub HRA advisors to develop a real estate revenue analysis and a separate ancillary revenue analysis. I'm gonna give you the highlights of each one. Um, we did this working closely, uh, the city working closely with HART um, when they were exploring the P3 uh, industry analysis. And, you know, Andy has, has brought to you and you're moving forward with the rail side of that. We really wanted to see, uh, going back uh, starting in January, if the P3 infrastructure industry would be interested in bundling in the real estate development with the infrastructure RFP. You know, quick answer to that question was largely no. When we went with them on industry day, it was a little too complicated and the risk for TOD is different than the risk for infrastructure. But you'll see in this analysis, we, we looked at, if we went all in, would it be attractive enough to major developers to package it all together? And would that help deliver, you know, real quicker and contribute to operating costs? So we're separating out the analysis moving forward is, does it make sense you know, how much revenue could we generate for rail operating? And we'll, we'll talk in that framework. Um, so we looked at what are the likely near-term sites for TOD along the rail line, both ones that were purchased by HART uh, and, and controlled by HART and other ones that the city owns as well. What's the potential value of near-term TOD opportunities on those properties? What's the long-term total value of those looking at 40 or 50 years? Um, what's the potential value of the ancillary revenue? I'll break down exactly what that is on upcoming slide. Um, and then what's the best implementation approach from a procurement pr perspective? You know, do we want to, we already said we don't want to bundle it with the infrastructure P3, but do we want to take those sites collectively, Hart and City, um, and bundle them into a master plan contract or leased individually? And, you know, Chair Shin will talk about that at the end. 
Harrison, this, yeah. uh, the E and Y looked at the entire, all the stations, the entire guideway, right? That's correct. Not yeah. just the city center area. That's correct, yeah. Okay, so their analysis on the potential revenue sources for O&M is looking at the entire package, right? That's correct, okay. yeah. And we even, in those, we even included a couple of sites that are not in TUD zoning. They're in Kaka'ako, for instance. So we looked at literally, and... You'll you see there, there, there's a list of, you know, I've got some numbers coming up, but we looked at stuff that we don't even really think necessarily policy-wise that we should develop yet, but we wanted to, you know, to, to attract developers, we wanted to put in every scrap that could potentially be considered. Okay. Um, of, those, of those TOD sites, um, it's a little hard to read this, but of the TOD sites with medium to high potential, that was about six of them in terms of near term. And I'll, I'll come to the calendar in a minute. It's about 11 acres. Three of those were hard owned. Three of them city owned. Technically, they're all city owned, but you know some of them are hard controlled purchase for the rail system. The ones with lower long term potential. There was a total of 340 acres of those. 20 acres hard and 320 acres um, city. Um, I want to highlight this. This included some city properties that are outside of TOD area, particularly a couple of the larger ones. Um, some that we really think uh, um, as part of the affordable housing strategy should be um, dedicated to affordable housing, but we wanted to see what it would look like if, if they contributed to rail operations. Okay, this did not include Ala Moana, right? The last station? It did not, no, it did not include that. We did not, because again, we only looked at ones that are owned or controlled by city. And this, of course, doesn't include the 2,000 acres of state property as well. So just picking five of those uh, to go into a little more detail, uh, there's a, a piece, if you look at the map on the bottom, right next to the station in West Lock, um, a piece in Pearl Ridge right around the station, roughly the size of two Chinatown size blocks that we acquired primarily for a place to the, for the bus to turn around, but also looking at development of that parcel. Um, in the Civic Center, um, we, we looked at the, uh, it's a site that is essentially the uh, fire department headquarters, but this would be only developing the parking lot area of that, not the, not the headquarters. It's close to the town. Um, we looked at, and that's one that we don't think is, is really ripe uh, because it has issues with the fire department. We literally looked at every scrap that's developable. Uh, and in Kaka'ako, this is not at a station, it's uh, along Waimanu Street where the curve goes between Waimanu and, and Kona. And so this is adjacent to the guideway, and this is a pretty developable site. And Ryan will talk more details about each of these. Um, we looked in those near-term ones, what, what it might take realistically to get them going. Pearl Ridge is the, the soonest one. We're getting ready to go out with RFP for that next year. Um, you can see some of these take a little while to develop and the coordination. You don't really want to build a tower next to the guideway until the guideway is con doing construction, but you might want to have that foundations going in at the same time. So it's a little bit of a feasibility look at when we might be getting the revenue. Um, and then this is really just looking at the ground lease revenue potential. You know, these numbers are generated for each site, you know, in the main report if you want to dig into it. But in terms of overall potential and roughly looking at a 40-year period, if you look at the graphs, you can see that um, there's a little bit of a lift when rail goes into the, the, there's not much revenue in the first five years when the first half of the rail is running and then it jumps up a little bit. And this is where EY and HRA's analysis looked at um, probably not gonna see huge development on many of these properties until rail has been running for about 10 years for market assumption. So there's a little bit of a lift and then it really starts taking off about 10 years after rail is completed. Um, so significantly more development. In the colors, the, you know, the yellow is from the smaller heart parcels. The green is the city. There's two dotted lines, you know, that were like the low point and then the mid, the higher point. So this is the midpoint. Over roughly a 20-year period, it would be total $280 million of, of lease revenue off of all of those properties. Um, and that would be roughly 22% at, at the max there, 22% of the operating and, and maintenance revenue. 
muted. But that um, that projection does not take into consideration the mayor's policy about prioritizing affordable housing. That's correct. On city uh, or even hard acquired land yeah. as a use, and if and for catalytic uh, purposes, the affordable housing could be that they, they would give the ground lease of a dollar or something, or some minimal amount to a potential developer who would be able to develop the property. That's correct. Right? Okay. Yeah. And, and since that's a, we were just doing the analysis, that's a policy okay, decision so, to okay, be made. Okay, so the ground lease revenue in this, in this projection is based upon what, best use for the property? Yeah, okay. yeah, so, and, and again, they went through for each property and some of that best use assumptions were some of them are only in a rental market, you know, and for city, we didn't really look at condo sales on most of it, you know, it's a rental. Uh, they, they did some analysis of roughly how much uh, retail and commercial that they could see in there and get a little higher, you know, ground lease for the retail commercial. It also grows over time. That's one of the other reasons you see this developing. So um, it'd be a safe assumption to say it'd be more like, you know, if we took out the ones that are, you know, city dedicated to mostly affordable housing, you might be more looking at that lower dotted line. But we didn't do a site by site analysis. Again, that's a policy decision to be made. We just wanted to look at the value of, if it, if it was all in, is there enough to, to attract, uh, you know, a master developer. The ancillary revenue that I mentioned um, we looked at, and again, there are no policy decisions about this. You know, if you look at the top left, one of the first things is a train wrap. We're not proposing to do those at all, but we wanted to have the consultants tell us how much might be generated off some of these. Um, digital displays in the stations, posters within the stations, in-train posters and displays, potential for uh, sponsorship, transit, I mean, when you go to Revolution, you'll find some, you know, some lines have done an extension to, to hospitals and they call that the health line, you know, and they get some money every year from the, from the hospitals. Um, the, the other concessions, things like storefronts or ATMs, kiosks, both within and outside the stations, vending machines. And then things like right-of-way leasing for, you know, conduits in the guideway um, for uh, the the parking at the station, so they totaled up all of all of that potential. Um, the I want to be careful on this with the real estate revenue. They looked at specific sites and assumptions for each site. The ancillary revenue was just sort of looking at the what the industry averages are from other systems. So there's not quite as much level of detail in this. And then they kind of took a a mid round of what other folks have done. So. This is lower total volumes, but if, if you did max out the advertising and sponsors, you know, this might be, you know, naming the train after an airline or, a, you know, a you know, university, some, something, you know, we don't have a major football team, but something that brought in sponsor, you'd see, you know, the higher yellow. So a total of 141 million potential over, you know, that 20 year period. Um, you can see it grows over time as you get more riders, as you get more eyeballs, if you get more people buying coffee in the stations, could be as much as 6% of, of revenue, of operating uh, costs, you know, at the end of 40 years. If you look in total, the, uh, again, maxing out the, uh, both the real estate revenue and add in the ancillary and the fare box, you get up to as high as, in the middle ground, 58% of operating costs of rail, total impact on O&M funding. Um, getting a little bit more realistic about the um, TOD potential as well as some of the other potential, the midpoint on the right is more like 42% you know, of revenue, a little bit more realistic. Um, now one more slide and then I'm gonna hand it over to Ryan to talk about specific slides. We, we asked the consultants, uh, and you know, they talked with a lot of people at City and Hard and, and looked at what other uh, folks are doing. Um, what are the options for us? If we're not bundling them all together with the rail, which is where we ended up, what are the other uh, approaches to a uh, strategic approach to developing the city-owned lands, both City and Hard? You know, the first one is to kind of keep doing what we're planning on doing right now, RFPs for individual sites. That takes a lot of work 
um, at City to prepare and, and score and review each one of those. Um, that's kind of the biz business practice that we have so far. Um, the second one that we're not doing yet is having someone to do the brokerage and concessions management for all the activities that would happen in each station. Now that could be a city function in-house, but what many folks do is they hire a, a real estate and management firm that is paid a, a small amount and then gets a commission off of all the people and services that they get to happen in there. And you would basically generate a, um, you know, an RFP for that, and you know, it'd be a management team, integrated capabilities. Um, that would be something that would grow over time because at some of the stations, there's not a lot of eyeballs, there's not enough volume yet to have all these services, but over time, you could, you could have that grow considerably. So that's not for the TOD, that's just getting concessions and advertising and stuff into the stations. Um, and then the third is a master developer agreement for some of the larger sites and, you know, we've been exploring, and I think Ember will talk about this at, at the end of the meeting, we've been exploring whether it makes sense to package and bundle, whether it's all of them or just the more market-ready, larger ones, and have a master agreement with a master developer to, to bring those online quicker. <coughs> um, summary of the, the findings, you know, we found that two of the stations are kind of both market and implementation ready. Kakaka and Chinatown are closer, they're in the market, but the issue is just, you know, you can't bring them on at the same time as your, people are not going to buy the condo there or lease their condo if the guideway is being constructed. So it's got to be time with rail construction. Um, I mentioned, you know, the, the Heart City revenue could be annually four to eight million, not a big number, but a significant one from, from that period uh, and, you know, up to eight in the 2045, approximately 280 million. Ancillary could could generate as much as six percent of OM OM costs, and then we'll talk more about the implementation methods at the end. Brian, okay. thank me. Sorry. Next question, Harrison. Sure, I sure. just ask you. Uh, uh, you know the TOD possibilities are very exciting, mm -hmm. as exciting as the rail itself. I think um, with a great deal of potential and. Uh, as I understand your presentation, this is what the potential is, what the possibilities are that the uh, result of your study and going to conferences. I, I'm just curious at this point, I know it's kind of premature, but it has uh, any, have any developers, uh, 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 any of the parties that are going to be necessary to make this actually happen in, you know, in a few years? Has anybody, and, and again, considering that there are no RFPs or anything, mm -hmm. have been an issue, but have any of the potential vendors, uh, developers expressed an interest or um, Absolutely. in this, you know, uh, at this point, and are looking forward to this? I guess I'm just trying to figure out whether we're just talking about pure... You mean for city or heartland or any private developers anything. that own land yeah. around yeah. in the Anyone, TOD area? So the TOD, yeah. so that, you know, we're, so again, we're talking about this as something that has potential, but in reality, have, have, have the people who are going to make it happen in the private sector begun to say, at least gather and say, hey, we can't wait for this to happen kind of thing? Or I'll give you the two-word answer and then the quick version as well. So two-word answer is it's happening. It's already happening, okay? Um, we have significant developer interest. You know, the five projects have been approved in Alawana, massive towers. Um, one more is in front of city council. I know of two, three, four more that are showing us preliminary plans in that area. Um, the, the state is doing mayor right at, you know, it, so that's moving along, you know, it, it, and Hunt, Hunt engineers have been selected for, for that one, or Hunt uh, developers, and, you know, they're moving forward through the environmental assessment. Um, there are uh, developers that own a lot of land, um, Kamehameha Schools School is one of them. I, they have been public that they have a master plan for Kapalama, and they're moving forward to time, you know, their development on those parcels near Kapalama. They'll be doing some public outreach soon about that. Um, so they have plans to do phases that would kind of, the project would open right when rail opens in that area moving forward. Um, there are developers that are looking in other sites in Evale. We've seen their master plans. Again, they're, they're timing that to be, you know, coming online, ready to occupy around 2025 when rail opens. Um, uh, there's interest in Pearl Ridge. Um, I, I am most pleased that there is um, 
a significant project in in design ready to move you know I, i'm not quite sure when they're going public but you know a significant project in waipahu and another one for affordable housing in west lock where there these are real projects and i'm and i'm totally convinced that that is coming out of the woodwork now even though we say that's a tough market it's coming out only because rail is completed and they're seeing the stations happen we can, if if there is interest by the uh, committee members we can schedule something really specific about in this, the opportunities in, this in the private sector developer. this yeah. presentation yeah. was lim was focusing on heart or city property yeah. because that's the one that we have to make a yeah. decision on very quickly but there's certainly a lot of activity and um, and we can bring a presentation to the board, to the committee, mm -hmm. about all the other activities that are yeah. going on throughout the station alignment. Um, but I have to say that the one thing which I think this committee needs to make a decision on fairly quickly in terms of our TOD policy, and that is what we're lacking. This is Ember's version of mm -hmm. what we're lacking. We're lacking no disrespect mm -hmm. to Harrison or Ryan or Kathy, but we were lacking um, a, a deal maker, a master deal maker. And I think Murthy and Andy and I have talked about this to help to someone to kind of put all these pieces together. And that's one of the things that we should talk about maybe at the end of this meeting and mm -hmm. certainly going forward over the next couple of meetings. If I could just add, uh we had the uh, P3 Industry Day back in February, and we did have some potential deal makers attend and express strong interest yeah. at that time. Yeah, we can talk right, more you. about that, but there, there is market interest, and we fed all that stuff into EY's analysis as well, so they're kind of aware of all of that. Right. Okay, uh, good morning. Again, um, my name is Ryan Tam. I'm the, uh, coming to you this morning in my capacity as the Assistant Deputy Director of Planning, uh, Environmental Compliance, and Sustainability for HART. Uh, um, I'm just going to give you a brief overview of the uh, start off with four of the HART owned sites, um, which are kind of the most promising for uh, TOD and uh, joint development. Um, we'll start off, uh, we'll talk about the Wyava Pearl Highlands uh, station in the center, and then Chinatown Co uh, HCDA site at the uh, Kakako station, and then uh, Waimano, Pensacola. And we can always come back to these afterwards if there are further questions. So this is mainly just a uh, orientation. So again, the uh, first site is uh, the uh, Wyava Station at Pearl Highlands. Again, the uh, guideway, uh, the station location is here, right across from the uh, Sam's Club uh, at a Koala Street intersection. Again, it's a 10.6 acre site. That's everything in purple. Um, the station and transit center and a parking garage will be located on this portion of the site and the rest of the site, about five to six acres, could uh, potentially be uh, developable. And uh, here you can see this is the H2 freeway going up north and then the uh, H1 continuing west. Again, this is a view of the site. The overview, again, we're building a uh, five to six story, uh, 1600 stall parking garage uh, and a transit center. This is all gonna be part of the, the P3 proposal along with a ramp, uh, access ramp that'll come down from H2 freeway. Brian, is this city or heart acquired land? Uh, this is actually heart. Heart acquired land? Heart acquired. Heart acquired in all, some of them is not purchased though? Uh, we're working, uh, I think we're in the process of completing the, uh, okay. the acquisition okay. for it. Uh, the next one is the uh, Chinatown station, next site. So this is a view looking down and towards uh, Nimitz Highway. This is the uh, harbor, harbor view. Um, the harbor is on the left. Again, the station platform uh, and the concourse connecting, this is in green, so this is going to be sitting over Nimitz Highway. Um, the area in pink, this is where the station entry building would be located. And the dashed line is also part of the parcel that we acquired and uh, we are in control of the site. Uh, the Igota building this is a historic building uh, that, that uh, we have uh, funds, federal funds to help uh, refurbish that, turn it into a bicycle uh, facility. And then the Hola Market, that's another uh, historic building that's uh, also uh, 
uh, potential. Again, there have been ideas in the past to maybe integrate that into the station as a retail. And the building next to it, the Harbor View, that's a city property, yes, right? Yes, correct. Okay, and so there's a possibility of doing something together. Yep. Possible. Yep. Okay. Oh, and there's historic preservation issues with this property? Correct. Okay. Yeah, correct. So the Hola Market, uh, this is a historic building, also the Igoto. And so we'll need to make sure that we uh, find ways to kind of preserve those buildings and uh, maintain the historic integrity of those sites. And again, about 4,000 people uh, uh, a day expected to use this station in 2030. Mm -hmm. And I, I would just add in terms of developability, since the city is doing a rail access project to turn Kekaliki Street into an extension of the mall and outdoor plaza, we don't need to reserve open space on this site so it could fully Well, develop. you're talking about pedestrianized walkway on Kekaliki. Yeah, right? so that could be kind of the station plaza yeah. area. We don't need yeah. to have open space on this site. Okay. Okay. And again, there's a view of the, again, the, the parcel and the station entry. Uh, next one is the Kakako Station. So again, we have a, this is under HCDA, uh, HCAD authority. Um, we have a small site, about 0.86 acres. Again, this is where the guideway comes down from Holly Kuila Street, Sports Authority, uh, the former Sports Authority site, Ross's, and then it cuts over to Queen Street. And um, so there's potential here uh, if we needed to do infrastructure to support uh, additional development. Again, uh, we're st I think we're in negotiations with uh, Howard Hughes on uh, on this site, so there are uh, some issues associated with that. Uh, before you go on, members, I asked Ryan to include this in there because to me this is a very exciting opportunity, but we don't own land here, and this was not part of the ENY study. But it certainly is something that is a subject of discussion as we go through the the issues on um, condemnation with the Howard Hughes. And so I wanted you to have a visual of this just so that you would at least know about it. As, um, and there's, but again, this is, we're only getting an easement so far, although there has been discussion, I understand, of other takings. But that's all up in the air now. It may be a little premature, but it's going to come to a head fairly quickly. Mm -hmm because of the condemnation action. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Again, the next slide, as uh, Harrison mentioned earlier, is uh, hard-owned parcels um, at the intersection of Pensacola. This is Pensacola Street. We have uh, Waimano Street comes in and Queen Street. And then this is Kona Street. Uh, this is right on the backside of Side Street Inn. Again, uh, part, we had to acquire these parcels to get the guideway over from Queen Street onto Kona. Again, this is a view. Again, we have about 1.5 acres here. Uh, we are going to be locating a, a potentially a backup generator and a traction power substation at this site, um, but there are opportunities to uh, integrate it with other uh, facilities. Okay. I'm going to now briefly cover another uh, five stations, which uh, are in a mixture of uh, Hart, UH, uh, and city, UH Department of Land and Natural Resources lands, uh, including the Kioni I station, that's UH West Oahu, uh, Hoa'i I station at uh, West Lock, the Pro Ridge station, uh, uh, and then La Lagoon Drive, and then Kalihi. So again, Kioni I, uh, UH West Oahu station, again, this is on state land. Uh, we're currently building the station entry uh, on the UH West Oahu side. Uh, we're also building a parking ride. Um, again, we're configuring it so it's ready for TOD, actually. You can see this is an example of potential that we can do. We can put a parking ride in the center and in the future have a development go on the outside. We're also looking, uh, we're working with Department of Land and Natural Resources and DR Horton on a permanent parking ride facility, uh, 1,000 spaces on the Cocoa Head side of the station, the Mackay entry. And this would open up in 2025. So again, the current uh, configuration that we're looking at is putting a parking ride in the middle and uh, leaving space for development on the outside. And uh, that's something that uh, DR Horton has been really interested in to make sure that the uh, entrance to this community is very uh, welcoming and urban. Um, again, Hart does not own land at these facilities, at these sites. So we'll, um, the 
Department of Land and Natural Resources kind of will retain ownership and uh, and the development rights of it. But it's a put, it's an example of the potential type of integration. The next uh, station, uh, Westlock, Hawaii. Um, where the station is uh, very well under construction, uh, very well advanced. There's a potential. Uh, we have a kiss and ride lot that we can use for pickup and drop offs. Um, there's potential to develop over that, over that s portion of the station. And again, this is uh, going to be the gateway. This is a Farrington Highway. This is a Leoku Street. Don Quixote is right across the street. And this is going to be the primary gateway to Eva Beach and uh, Fort Weaver Road. So we're looking at maybe up 6,000 riders a day uh, boarding the rail at this location. So it's, it's going to be a big hub and a lot of potential. I'll turn this over to Harrison to talk about the uh, Pearl Ridge, the uh, Kalaau site. Sure. Um, <clears throat> DTS determined that they needed a, a, literally a place for the buses to turn around um, because, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of bus activity already in the area, but it needs to go both directions and go Makamakai. And so we, we acquired this for two purposes. One, for the bus station. Um, and Director Frisaki's team is working on a interim uh, bus station just for the interim opening. And then we're preparing to put the, this project um, out for an RFP for development. Uh, it could be as many as 300 units of housing. Um, the Since it's right next to the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail, we think this is, in, and five of the stations are either next to or within three blocks of the Pearl Harbor Historic Trail. So that's gonna be a big thing to take the train out and ride along Pearl Harbor and you know, a lot of activity. Um, our zoning will, will require people who are developing to face the trail and, you know, uh, have activity. We've talked with the private property owners on both sides. They're kind of very interested in, in following the city's lead. So, go ahead. Okay, and the next two sites are uh, hard-owned properties. Again, this uh, Lagoon Drive station. So the station is being uh, developed on both sides of uh, um, YY Loop at Lagoon Drive. Again, there was a former uh, Chevron uh, gas station there, and then there was a uh, cleaning, dry cleaning uh, facility. Um, one of the potential right down the street at the end of YY Loop, uh, right where the guideway crosses into Kehi Lagoon Beach Park, there's opportunity to uh, develop that site. Um, you know, as a you can see a rendering of buildings on either side of the guideway. And again, about 5,000 uh, 5, people a day uh, estimated to board the rail at this station, <coughs> Lagoon Drive. People coming down from Salt Lake, Salt Lake community uh, by bus down to the station. And then the last uh, station is uh, the Kalihi station. So again, the platform uh, will be sitting above Dillingham Boulevard uh, in green. The pink areas are the parcels right at Mokuea Street where we're going to be, uh, the station entrances are going to be located on either, either side. Again, the D-Light Bakery used to be here, um, uh, former 7-Eleven. And the uh, heart uh, we're actually widening Dillingham Boulevard by about 10 feet on the Mackay side. And so as part of that uh, real estate acquisition process, we actually had to get the full parcel. So there's uh, potential for this uh, area in, in, uh, in orange. And that is about one acre. So just here's another view of the uh, station entrance. This is the Malka side. So that, that uh, concludes an overview. Again, we can go back to that if there's specific questions on uh, each of the sites. Well, these are the, the key takeaways from the study. There's a lot of opportunities. I wanted to also highlight the, um, the state lands. In some cases, like the UH West Oahu uh, station, the state is working and looking at that as part of their planning process as well. So there's really good cooperation going on that. Um, when we're looking at developers from, from elsewhere, they come in and go, Oh, so it's the same rules on the whole island? You know, it's, 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 it's an advantage. Now, we, we, we do talk about our permit process, how long it takes to develop, but from, if you come from elsewhere, um, that, you know, the idea that there's just one entity for all the entitlements infrastructure is, is somewhat efficient. The fact that we're going ahead and adopting the TUD plans, giving the zoning, but not the extra height and density away for free, also helps save some time. We've got the infrastructure investment strategy, not all the money needed, but you know, but we've got a plan. 
And there's really strong public and policymaker support for the TOD policies and projects. Uh, City Council generally, you know, generally unanimous support for most everything that DPP proposes in, in TOD. And the public in general is accepting of the principles, so they may have comments on individual projects, but there's strong support for development as long as it delivers on those things that the public wants. And we'll talk more about the, um, the last bullet at the end. Ember? Yeah, I think that um, uh, I wanted to, we're gonna lose, start losing people in about mm. 15 minutes. So I wanted to start this discussion and go as long as we still have people here who can talk and are interested in continuing. Because there are a few things that we need to make a decision on in the next um, few months. Can you put up the timetable slide? Yeah. This is the, this is the goal that I've, I've, I'm asking our committee and our board to, to, to take it. Uh, and that is by December, this December, we need to identify what stations, if any, to include as options in the city center P3 RFP uh, for purposes of determining whether or not the station should be modified in any way. Keep, and that would be as simple as, so let me put it in the context here. When rail started, we started with rail only, no TOD. We built our stations, all of the first, how many stations have we designed already? 11? 13. 13, 13 stations without even an outlet for anything, nothing. Not a concrete pad, no water, nothing, nothing. And so with the P3 now for the city center uh, guideway into the most densest urban core, we actually have an opportunity now to revisit that policy decision that we made way, way, way long ago to do nothing that encourages TOD. We're, there isn't even an outlet to plug in a vending machine at any of our stations. That's how sterile our stations are. So we have the opportunity now, and I did not want us to lose this opportunity, and that's why we're on a tight time frame for December, to see if we want to do anything. We could do nothing, but at least we should have a discussion about whether or not we want to do something to make to do anything with our alignment or our stations to make it user-friendly to TOD, whether it's our, our own property, city, or state-acquired property, hard-acquired property, or for the private sector to develop around us. And I know that is not our charge for what we get funding for, but it is our charge in the charter to support transit-oriented development. And as a heart board, we have never put together a policy that embraces TOD. We've passed two resolutions that pretty much supported testimony, someone giving testimony in support of TOD, support of or against TOD type of initiatives that are by other governmental entities. But we as a board have never embraced any formal policy. So by December, I would like to do that so that we all know where we are. And by December, I would like us to make a decision on whether or not the city center, um, the phase two of the RFP, which specifies what everything is going to be, it, whether any of that is going to contain anything friendly to transit-oriented development, whether it's an outlet, water, or a concrete pad that incur that puts a coffee cart on there. That because the whole thing with TOD for the heart is ridership, isn't it? The whole thing. When we talk about revenue, it's all ridership. Right. Go ahead. Well, can I speak to this sure. most recent right. dialogue you're uh, offering? Because yes, in the beginning of this project, 10, 15 years ago, based on the experiences of others elsewhere where a project has been federalized, it was determined that it's not worthwhile to try and do things on the property that has been federalized because the federal government then would want a return proportionate to their investment in the project. So historically, a lot of projects have up to 80% federal money. And if you're getting revenue from the, the project, then you have to return 80% of the revenue to the federal government. I understand uh, that that's changed that in fact, 
you still have to respect the federal investment in the project, but you can retain the federal share of the revenue being generated so long as you reinvest that revenue 100% back into the project. Mm -hmm. So I need to get um, direction to maybe core to make sure that's correct, that okay. we need a legal opinion that that in fact has changed. Right. In which case I think that that opens a big door for us to explore, which really wasn't open before. Okay. The other thing, thank you, and that's a really good, good point, because the other thing that we need to decide before December, and that is the O&M part of it. We listened to a lot of slides and presentation, and you should see the Ernst & Young um, documents. It's 137 slides. We didn't, we whittled it down to for you for in about 30, but uh, if you want the whole presentation from Ernst & Young, uh, it has a really uh, long, very detailed analysis of revenue for O&M. And, and part of what we need to decide here is whether or not any of the stations will be friendly to activities that encourage revenue for O&M. And that is somewhat of a hard issue because we're still b building the rail and the stations. But it really is, from a policy standpoint, um, a city issue. And I met with the mayor on um, Tuesday, seems like forever ago, to discuss this with him. So that's something that he knows he has to come up with um, some policy issues in order to meet the phase two of the RFP process as well, to see if there's anything within the station or guideway design that is significant enough that he wants to encourage revenue for O&M. And again, and, I'm, and I don't want to belittle this, but it's like if we want to do advertising and it requires electricity, we need an outlet, <laughs> we need a plug, we need the wiring for that, something which is not at all in any of our station designs at the moment. So, and of course, anything that you do with station design, you should do it now. I mean, this is the time to do it, not six months from now through a change order um, or a year from now when they're actually starting to break ground. So that's the short end of things in terms of our timeline, December. And then I have April 2019 as a longer term issue, and that is primarily whether this board wants to adopt a policy that encourages TOD development, whether it's through, and you have it in the slide that whether it's through an RFP for mm. proposal, a master developer, or uh, some kind of a, uh, uh, a property management doing concessions, or any of those types of activities, whether this board wants to take a position, whether it's proactive or, or passive, um, in working with the city to determine uh, the best way to do that. Uh, I do not want us to lose the opportunity, thank you John Henry. I do not want us to lose the opportunity to make a decision in this. We have hard acquired property. We have um, Waimanu and Westlock, which are shovel ready, prime for a developer to come in there or someone to come in and try to figure out what to do with those areas. For the Waimanu area, we need to do that now because as we go into the city center, we have an opportunity to do whatever we need to do to the city center alignment or the guideway or whatever to, to facilitate at that type of development. For Westlock, that boat, is, I mean, that ship has sailed a little bit, but it's still something that we want to do. So those are two shovel-ready um, areas. The third shovel-ready area is Chinatown, because we already acquired the property. We've had lots of discussion, lots of um, analysis about the potential for that property, and it's one of the most exciting things that we can do is the Chinatown area, because that is part of um, the city's Chinatown development project, and it, it's totally in alignment with all the revitalization efforts that we're doing in the, in the River Street area. And so, the, again, um, it's, it, the time is now to think of what we want to do with it, getting people on board to look at that, and whether, again, this board wants to do proactive, inactive, or passive encouragement of this type of a project. And then we have two others that are not quite 
um, before you. Um, well, the one that I asked Ryan to put the slide on, and that's the Kaka'ako station with, with the Howard Hughes. But the other one is the Ala Moana station with the city's acquisition of the entire Watermill property and our station going through there. Again, that's an op incredible opportunity in the most, the hottest real estate area in town in terms of development mm -hmm. for us to make a decision as to whether or not we want to, how that station is going to be friendly to any kind of development in the Ala Moana or if we're going to do nothing, active, proactive, nothing. But those are some of the issues I think that we would like to look at for purposes of an April deadline for discussion to see if we can get guidance, give guidance to the city. Um, the mayor is very on board um, with, the, uh, with all the exciting developments that we can do in TOD. Uh, he's primarily interested in getting the rail built, obviously, that's his primary focus. But he understands and is very encouraging of this. And of course, April, the deadline for April is because, as you know, we are into budget. And so any of this stuff costs money. And as since HART is now partially funded, our administrative costs are partially funded by the city. If there's anything that's going to be in HART's budget or the city's budget, that's why we have December and April dates to coincide with the budget um, process as well. So we can look at that. So that's my mini speech, and you have five minutes to tell me what you think before you leave, John Henry. <laughs> I don't have a motion. We're not here to take action. This was just an information session to get us thinking. I think by our no when we meet again in November, um, we're going to have a written um, heart policy for you guys to look at and to think about. But if you have suggestions on what you think the policy ought to be, now's the time to, to talk about it and have a discussion. Go ahead. Um, I'm fully supportive of looking at all the uh, TOD possibilities. I think that if we're going to look at programmatic things like parking, uh, we need to make sure that we understand who else is involved in setting parking policy. So the rate commission, I believe mm -hmm. corporate council has already provided the rate commission with some legal opinion as to what their role is in terms of multimodal systems and what's uh, DTS's responsibilities when it comes to parking. Uh, so I think we should make sure that we're dovetailing to um, making sure that we're not duplicating or conflicting with anybody else's responsibilities in that regard. Also, uh, on page 20, um, there's an accumulation of all these revenue possibilities. And I think it's important to recognize that uh, people are very sensitive to pricing in their travel. Mm -hmm. And so when you introduce parking at the outlying stations, in addition to the fare revenue, one offsets the other. Uh, what happens is you lose ridership when you have a parking cost, usually in a ratio of for every 10% increase in that trip cost, be it the fare for the system or the parking cost, you lose about 3% of your ridership. So we, make, we need to make sure that these things aren't additive, uh, that in fact uh, there is some um, other aspects to the parking possibilities other than uh, just the pure revenue side of it. Plus, there's also at each of these locations, in terms of access modes, very sophisticated and complicated interfacing with Uber, Lyft, tour buses, and the list goes on and on. I don't want to go through it all. But we also have to take that into consideration. So um, I just want to make sure this committee, uh, when it develops its scope of work for what it's going to do, uh, make sure, makes sure that it focuses on what is most appropriate for the Hart Board. Mm -hmm. If I could just supplement what Wes said, you know, uh, I'm very interested in, as Annie knows, what the impact on all of this, parking, rideability, all of that, with the autonomous vehicle <coughs> technology. That, mm -hmm. You know, I just read that Phoenix is launching their uh, trial system. I forget which company it is, but they've got millions of miles of, 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 of experience in with these trials so well, now they're actually rolling out a pilot project and so i know there's some doubters but i'm not one of them i, mm -hmm. I think autonomous vehicles are inevitable and so that's going to be a disruptive technology to to what happens with you know 
mass transit. I, I personally think that it's going to help our ridership because that first mile, last mile, then people won't have to necessarily rely on a bus system or anything. You know, with Uber and Lyft and all these ride-hailing uh, companies investing billions, literally, in, in autonomous vehicle technology, I, I think that's going to be a big uh, additive to our, our ridership. The other question I had is... Could, could, uh, yes. Board Member Lee, um, I think Ryan Tam can respond to the autonomous yeah. vehicle. Yeah, and I want to say, you know, we've been working very closely with the city and then the Ulupona initiative on looking at the potential for uh, how autonomous vehicles will affect uh, the project and kind of the potential for um, opportunities in, in our P3 project. And so we actually brought a consultant on board uh, to study this aspect and mm -hmm. they're going to be uh, wrapping up the report. They were here uh, last month oh. to talk to us. We, so. we do mention it to every single developer that we talk with, both in the amount of parking they're going to need as well as the configuration of that first floor more for future drop-offs. There's not going to be enough curb space. Okay. We looked at it in that, you know, that uh, DLNR, the UH West Oahu, that, that garage there as well. Yeah. And we, we yeah, sorry. No, go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, we've been talking to a lot of the different uh, stakeholder communities, uh, developers, and different agencies mm -hmm. on this potential. So, Terrific. But, um, the other question I had is, uh, what's the desirability of actually building housing above the rail stations, not surrounding it or adjacent to it, but actually above it in the airspace? Um, we, we have looked at that and encouraged Hart to look at it in some cases. It's more complicated because of that federal issue you have to follow. You have to either follow different federal guidelines for joint development and separate the, the stations, or you have to purchase back the federal investment in the property, you know, in one or the other. Um, it, it's, uh, it can make sense at a couple of these. Um, in terms of, and, you know, we talked with Andy Murthy about the constructability. You, you've got to account for vibration and more. more. So for, for big towers over, it could make sense. We've had one developer look at potential for developing over a city street at a station and bridging, but nobody's quite ready to, to go on that. So it's being explored, but no real projects yet. So I, I have questions. Um, speaking as a DPP hat, We've had ordinances in place for TOD support on a policy and regulatory standpoint for the, since 2010. So we are fully engaged and committed to TOD. Um, so we would welcome any kind of direct or indirect support from the Hart Board and the Hart um, entity in general. My question would be, when you're looking for a motion at some point in the near future, are you talking about Hart's role or policies or a geographic area you want to engage in as a priority or is a funding you know a role and whose budget would that be in by April 19 because it's too late to be I believe in the state's budget which would be a long shot but for the city we've already put in our preliminary budgets and would that be included now in a heart budget request or well, you're asking technical questions that I'm not sure I have an answer to. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that, so I can answer part of your question. The, I would like to have a heart policy, TOD policy, the parameters of which is still not clear to me. The other thing that I think that we need to make a decision on, and maybe it's a, not a formal vote, but at least it should give some direction to Andy and Ryan and the rest of the Hart staff as to which priorities we have so that they can think about what needs to be done to the station mm -hmm. design. For example, if Chinatown is a priority, which, you know, that's one of my favorite places mm -hmm. to look at, <laughs> or mm -hmm. Westlock, or we can't do that for the P3 um, city center. But certainly, the, 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 um, we can do that for the Pearl Highlands garage. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, but there was one more missing that would go into the city center. Um, well, there's Kalihi and Kakako. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think maybe I'm thinking of Ala Moana, which mm -hmm. we're not Moana. even ready to analyze yet. But hopefully, we will within the next couple of months. But I'd like so I think that it behooves us to give some direction because we're not going to be able to do it all. We're not going to be able to do it all. And we may not be able to afford it all. And so if we can focus in on the ones that are the most important mm -hmm. priorities for us, 
that we would like mm -hmm. to use the city center um, P3 project to um, to be some sort of user friendly to TOD efforts, mm -hmm. then um, we'd like that direction by December. And finally, Kathy, on your budget issue, I mean, I have talked to the mayor, it, whether it is, you're not gonna make, knowing what I know about the budget process, it's January, that <laughs> you may have turned in your documentation and everything, but it's January when the decisions get made. Mm -hmm. At least it wasn't my date. Yeah. And yeah. so there's still a little bit of time for us to, and whether it's mm -hmm. your budget, DPP's budget, or the land management group, or somebody else, um, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. That's something that's up to the city to figure out. Mm -hmm. Or whether it's Hart's budget, in terms mm -hmm. of trying to bring in some sort of person or persons or entity to work with the city in trying to coordinate all of these um, uh, possibilities mm -hmm. for development. Yeah. I mean, that is certainly the, the, the fourth option. Mm -hmm. So a simple, um, not necessarily a big idea would be perhaps to suggest that the board policy be to direct heart to work in full cooperation with the state and city's priorities for, sure. for TOD for sure. and kind of mm -hmm. leave it at that. And then mm -hmm. they can figure out the details of what that mm -hmm. means, well, station by station. Yeah, I mean, certainly if there's an overarching um, policy that would be friendly like that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Ember, could I, could I just add yeah. one thing? Um, I wanted to mention, you, you mentioned a couple of questions about, you know, Kaka'ako or, you know, the Alamoana property. Right. Um, I talked with, with Steph in, in looking at our, our existing contracts. We might be able to squeeze out a couple of pennies um, to, and some staff time to do some analysis of, of one or both of those properties. It might help us if, if you were able to tell us which one of the two, if, we, if we're limited in capacity. That wasn't part we, of the e and Yeah, study. the ones that were not done in the e and analysis. So um, the last thing is I, I would uh, like to, sorry, um, like to mention that um, we do have the uh, consultants on board. If anybody does have any questions for them, I do want to again acknowledge to you and Maya and Adam Christian, if you had any questions about the study, um, okay. they're available. Go ahead. Hi, Amber. Uh, thank you, Amber. Um, I've got a much more basic question, I think. I mean, on one level, in terms of where, what the board has to consider in terms of its policy, you know, as we listen to the presentation, it seems like a no-brainer that we, as a board, should be supportive of TOD. And uh, and so I guess I'm, 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 one of the questions I have in this regard is, it sounds also like long before either of us got on this board, or perhaps any of us who are now here on the board, the decision was made not to be involved in TOD. And as a matter of policy, and I guess I'm just curious as to why that was and what the downside, all of them, what I'm picking up now, that there will be budget issues in terms of how deeply we get involved in TOD that we'll have to consider. But I mean, as an overall policy, I assume the first one is, are we in favor of it? And again, like I said, it seems to me sitting here right now without knowing more, it's a no-brainer that we should be. But, but why, uh, do you know, Ember, uh, why originally uh, we were <laughs> not right i don't know if you know <laughs> he's only been on i can probably speak to that <laughs> so you know with the prior composition of the board and you know and advice that we got it was basically the heart board and heart as an organization really didn't have jurisdiction over tld because all mm -hmm. we were focused on is building the rail project which would explain why our rail stations don't have plugs and things like that to accommodate anything uh, that would facilitate TOD. But I think, you know, recognizing that these are huge lost opportunities to create, you know, a, 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 a better uh, increased ridership, you know, more positive community impacts, that sort of thing. I think the thinking, particularly with our current board, has shifted. And now, you know, we see the importance of heart as an organization being as supportive of TOD as possible within the constraints of what our authority is. And so I think, you know, Kathy's uh, a suggestion that just as a policy decision, we should vote as a board 
to be supportive of TOD. I mean, Ryan, I think, has, has been devoting a fair amount of attention to that. Um, and one of my questions is whether he needs more resources for that. So if we adopt that as the policy, then we need to make sure we provide the necessary resources to support the city and state's efforts to promote TOD. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, it has to be a, a collaborative, uh, synergistic effort in order for it to succeed. If, if I could um, offer from slightly outside view, um, uh, taking us back to even before I started five years ago, there was a, a good reason Looking back, it might might have you know been short-sighted, but a good reason that the city council before there was heart directed the rail uh, planners to buy the absolute minimum land around each station because of concern about impact on the landowners and community. That was a wise decision at the time, but unlike a lot of other places, uh, heart does not own or control enough land of the station due to development in most areas. So that was a policy decision long before heart existed. Um, and then because of the concerns about building rail on time and on budget, the designers and engineers have been directed to just focus on delivering the system. You know, so uh, folks like Ryan and Planning and work closely with us in TOD. There's conceptually strong uh, alliance. Uh, Ember, you went along on, on the, um, we did walking audits of all stations with Hart and all city agencies five years ago. And so the, for the connectivity to TOD, um, D DTS has hired a, a coordinator that worked closely with Hart about the, where to have the connectivity. Hart is doing improved crosswalks at a lot of the stations. And so th a lot of the connectivity to connect to the surrounding neighborhoods is working well with DTS and Hart together, the drop-offs, things like that. And, and so that, that part is, is moving really well. It's really this function of do we spend a little extra money and from where does that money come to improve the stations and do we do you know more development ready stuff in a few remaining sessions but the uh, just let me finish one, my, my mm -hmm. one thought ryan sorry yeah. uh, the and harrison and both of you bring up the, mm -hmm. the really important one of the really important points mm -hmm. in terms of lost opportunity and that's the acquisition i mean hard has the policy of hard was to acquire the absolute minimum to build mm -hmm. the guideway and the station without regard to the opportunities that could have happened by mm -hmm. a larger acquisition. Now, granted, we couldn't afford to buy it, mm -hmm. and we still can't afford to buy it, but that's not the point, because I think that the policy that as that part as a board can make, and that's to have our people who are looking at acquisition to look at it from a bigger picture. I mean, mm -hmm. for example, in the Howard Hughes and the Kaka'ako station, you know, I wish we had looked at it five years ago and said, okay, let's buy the whole sports authority, let's buy mm -hmm. the whole thing, and then let's find resources to do that. Uh, so, so because, I mean, it's an incredible piece of property there. It, it, just like the discussion that the mayor is having with the Ala Moana station, you know, let's not just buy, acquire just for this. Let's think about a bigger picture and the opportunities that are available wherever the money has to come from for something else. Yeah. And I think that's a policy issue that we still can make as a board because we still have some acquisition. I mean, even the Servco warehouse, I mean, that's an alternative in the mm -hmm. Civic Center station, yep. right? Yep. I mean, that's a huge opportunity there. I go drive by that warehouse all the time. It's empty. They've moved out already. Well, and you know, to your point, Amber, you know, the, the, and it's a political decision, but, and a policy decision, but, you know, the law is clear that if the, uh, the city in exercising its condemnation powers feels that acquiring these other lands for TLD development is appropriate, it can do that. And it doesn't have to fund it itself. It can do it through a P3 or in partnership with a private developer that would actually fund the acquisition, so. Yeah. So it, it, the, 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 the law is clear. I thought there was a Supreme Court case that said it couldn't benefit private enterprise. But it's not because the overriding uh, uh, consideration is the, is the public, public interest, in, interest in, in redeveloping, you know, creating that area. That's right. the key. Yeah, excuse me, Trishan. I just wanted to uh, bring two points up. So one is, again, going back to the early part of the project when it was under development, 
Um, the larger TOD was um, deliberately uh, separated from the project um, in order to kind of minimize the uh, the conflicts that we could get during the EI environmental impact statement process. So TOD was deliberately separated out, and so um, anytime you know we start looking at joint development, you know there are environmental issues that we'll have to consider. Um, so that um, the board should mm -hmm. be uh, aware of. Um, and then the other uh, point, uh, again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Member Lee, for your consideration in terms of staffing and resources. I think the issue that we always face with the project is we've already designed a, a lot of it. And mm -hmm. so any adjustments that we need to make um, to the design to add retail space, to add foundations, that um, entails a lot of a design and engineering um, resources. So that, that's where the uh, issue comes on. Can I ask Ryan a technical question? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, Ryan, sometimes on these slides, you mentioned the ridership numbers. Yes. Are those from the EIS, or are they a bit upsized? Uh, these, these are actually the updated, so the using the latest Oahu uh, MPO okay. modeling And that reflects all the additional TOD development that was not included in the demographics of the original forecast? No, not yet. Okay. I, don't, so I don't think so. I, I want to pick up on what you just said, because it's kind of important. Sometimes when we do these ridership numbers, they, one of the federal requirements is you can't um, juice your numbers by assuming that you'll have intensive development around train mm -hmm. stations. But in fact, that's already occurred. So when we were doing the original ridership forecasts, they were based on population and employment projections, which then you go through a process to get to your transit ridership that were really lower than what we're experiencing what we'll have at these TOD locations in particular. So when are we going to get to the point where we have ridership numbers that reflect what we display when we talk about the housing potential at the TOD locations? Like, you know, Harrison showed a chart that had all the housing possibility at the different TOD sites, but that's not been woven into the transit ridership projections, right? Or to some degree, so. but not to the entire. Yeah, I think to some degree, um, as the as the project gets pushed out, you know, the development um, gets incorporated into the Oahu, the MPO, the regional uh, forecast, land development forecast. So if we get mm -hmm. updated numbers from DPP, we can incorporate I'll talk that. to you on the side about this, sure. but I'm, I'm kind of concerned we're still working with old numbers. Yeah. Well, sure. on those, those slides, Ryan, while you're, you're at it, I had a question kind of related to that more out of personal curiosity. Um, in terms of the number of parking spaces that will be, uh, you know, that, that are going to be built, mm -hmm. because that obviously will be directly related to how many cars we get off the road between, I don't know, Pearl Highlands or even closer in, mm -hmm. and off of each one coming into town every day. So I don't know if you have those numbers at this point. How many spaces, uh, how many cars are we expecting to get off uh, of each one? Once all the parking has been built that is currently planned. Can, can I? Because this is one of my favorite topics. So at Pearl Highlands, for example, it seems like that's a very big garage, 1,600 spaces. But even with those old numbers, and seen the EIS, the actual demand for that garage was 2,600 cars. And I think that's low. Mm -hmm. So um, let me chime in a little bit. So Hoyt, what you said earlier about, well, this seems like common sense to include TOD into the design. Actually, before, you, before you do, Kathy, I just want to know, I'm, again, because it'll get lost, how many spaces are we planning to build in parking lots? So Kurt, the project has planned uh, 4,100, 4,100 stalls, mm -hmm. spaces, uh, and that's mainly on the west side. <laughs> the, the but Hoyt, the issue is if you build them, they will come so no, it doesn't exactly. matter how many you build I mean it gets, just gets worse so you don't want to actually encourage people to ride it or drive Sorry, to the stations it, it's very costly for per rider to have the those spaces there you know built by the public we have one of the best bus systems in the country and most people have access so the focus in most areas is to be able to you know take a bus uh, a uh, tremendous ridership uh, from people walking, biking, you know, near stations as development occurs. Um, and, and so when you think about, say, the Pearl Highlands facility, so that's a $200, $250 million facility for 1,600 stalls. So you can kind of do the math on terms of the cost per, per 
driver. Okay. No, no, I, so. I understand. That would be the overall mm-hmm. theory involved. But, you, you know, it seems to me if you, um, people who drive now are not, it, it's going to be a bridge too far to say, okay, instead of driving, I want to jump on the bus so I can drive 20 minutes to get to the, you know, m- my station as opposed to being able to get to drive, yeah. you know, but, drive. I understand. Mm-hmm. You know, we want to keep the left road. Maybe that's the grand scheme. And I guess you've answered my question. 4,000. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I think in the future, the potential is you can hop in an autonomous vehicle and it'll take you on demand, take you anytime sure. to, okay. to the station. Okay. So... Um, okay, I got it. So maybe going back to your question. To no, no, I just wanted to answer the oh, question, which was about what the forecast the model has. So the base demand or forecast for ridership was based on our analysis, because that's our job, to project the future population and housing by locations. And so we were instructed to provide that information for the model based on the existing zoning. Yeah. Since then, we have the TOD plans, the new market forecast, and the new zoning. So if you're continuing to base it on the base information from the EIS, it is outdated. I would also add that, um, you know, so for the formal analysis required by the federal analysis, you have to use that adopted mm-hmm. zoning. And mm-hmm. um, we also uh, worked with uh, BRP, hired Calthorpe Associates to do what we call scenario analysis. Uh, in 2013, that scenario analysis, which we can provide you, uh, actually calculates all of the projected demand that we talked about and all of our TUD zoning. And so there's, it shows significantly more ridership, significantly less VMT and energy use. And so when you do that scenario analysis, um, we, you, you know, it, it, it shows the kind of numbers that you're looking at. Um, I would add that the uh, uh, Dr. Sokogawa's team is developing the, the update for the primary urban center development plan right now. And we uh, contracted with somebody to use Calthorpe's new model. It's called Urban Footprint. We also have a license and, you know, Ryan and Ben um, are also going to be playing with it. And that we'll be doing that analysis in updating the primary urban center development plan, not just for TOD area, but for the whole area. So, so I, I guess I could ask... Um Quite, you're, you're just so being so common sense, <laughs> but your question is why aren't we, in, you know, incorporating more TOD variables or goals into the station design and stuff? And so I think we should ask Andy whether he agrees that in the past, mm-hmm. at least, the the philosophy was if you add that, that's more variables, that slows down the process, it adds costs, and above all. The mantra is on schedule under budget, right? So mm-hmm. I think we should ask Andy if it can be reasonably done without, you know, sacrificing those two goals. Okay. <laughs> I think in the city center it can be done. We, we're going out for design, build, finance, operate, maintain. So even though there has been effort to at least programmatically design the stations up to a certain point, uh, the, the, the new proponents will be redesigning the stations the way they see fit. So the opportunity, as uh, Director Shin mentioned, is that uh, uh, there's an opportunity to incorporate, uh, let's say, you know, additional square footage for uh, retail, as an example. Maybe a clever station design where they can leave unfinished space for future development, those mm-hmm. kind of things. But as, as Harrison mentioned, we presumably there's an additional cost for that, um, and we'll have to figure out how we, how we can incorporate that in the RFP, what the policy is for that, and who's going to pay. But I think the opportunity, at least for the, the eight stations, is, is definitely there, and I don't, I don't really see it having a schedule impact. Yeah. If I, uh, just a uh, last word on parking, by the way, is that in my experience from watching what happens at BART at their many parking stations, mm-hmm. and what, especially once DOD yeah, gets developed, is that a lot of those spaces are, being, are, are, are not accessible by commuters because people shopping, you know, mm-hmm. they're going to use those spaces up too. So there's, you know, be a premium. But that being said, actually, my, going back to my basic question, which is what are we hoping to accomplish by December? <laughs> I mean, I, on one level, I, I gather it's going to be that as a board, we now support the extent legally uh, permissible, you know, the idea of working with the city and anyone else, developer, whatever, whomever, uh, to uh, support the development of TOD. I mean, that's that's sort of what I'm gathering. That'd be the basic things. We probably it sounds like we aren't there yet. 
but after that then what it sounds like we open up this whole <laughs> well, okay. You open up the uh, whole, whole, you know, you have Pandora's box as to different issues that come out as who's paying for what, how we get involved, mm -hmm. redesign, this, that, and the other thing. And so I'm just trying to get an idea of being on this committee and and wondering how to allot my time and what to expect going forward. Uh, what are we going to be doing after that? Okay, so Andy, um, in one of our prep meetings, um, I asked you to come up with some recommendations. So is it possible for you and your staff to come up with recommendations by our November 15th meeting? I know there's so much going on with the recovery plan and all of that stuff. I understand that. So maybe that's not yeah. feasible. Um, maybe we have to set a special TOD meeting um, as opposed to being co-joined with the, with the hard board meeting. But come up with recommendations for what stations you think might be amenable to any type of design issues or, or recommendations within the city center that would be for the board to look at and consider for purposes of phase two of the P3 um, RFP. Yes, I think so, because okay. as you mentioned, uh, we really should have it completed by December, so. Right. Mm -hmm. So right. let's do that. Okay. So um, you guys talk about it and give me a recommendation on when you think you could have that for us, mm -hmm. given all the demands on your time, and then we'll figure out when we can set the next meeting for, um, for that discussion. Um, and on my part, um, working with you and staff, I want to put together a, a, a policy for us to consider. But members, are, is there anything else in terms of facts or information that you think you need on this area as we move forward? Um, I know that you have a wish list of, to get more information about what's going on. That probably won't happen before December, but hmm. maybe in the next 20, in early, 2019, we could do that. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else that you need, members? Any inf information that we could work on to help guide us in this? No? Yeah. I, I don't need information necessarily. Everybody can always use more information, but can I offer a suggestion to see whether what I'm anticipating as what they're going to present to us would be like? So, <clears throat> cutting to the chase. You could offer a provision in the P, um, RFP in the P3 that says, assuming you have a ceiling, right, where the bids cannot be over what we're willing to spend. So it, it, there's no deal if you're going to spend more money. So you would say, we would like you to provide opportunities for revenue generating, like the ones in the slide, concessions, naming, whatever, to the point where um, they would enhance the revenue generating and TOD support Understanding the ceiling on the limit and then how that money would be then distributed. They're going to provide an empty shell, but then are they going to say, I want some of the revenue because of the operating 30 years, but I'm going to expect 10% mm -hmm. off the top? I mean, how does that, in terms of, how would that be in the RFP? You're going to offer them this ability to have TOD elements in the station design, but you're going to have to talk about what the cost is and then who reaps the benefit of that revenue, what their share well, is. I as, as Harrison was discussing during the presentation, we, we received the feedback from industry and, and essentially made the decision to separate the infrastructure mm -hmm. from the, the real estate component. So I, I prefer in the DBFOM RFP not to start letting the real estate creep back in. However, I think the infrastructure folks can be charged with coming up with innovative ideas to create the space. So for example, unfinished retail space within the stations, how can they potentially incorporate that within the footprint of the station? Mm -hmm. Or potentially leave that as an option for future TOD. Um, same thing at Pearl Highlands. If, if they're building the garage in the transit center, what accommodations could they make for future TOD to come in? Uh, potential to build a high rise over a station how can we incorporate the foundations and the footings in, the, in our RFP so that the city can tender or somebody else can tender a development at a later date? Those, those kind of hooks, if you will, into the infrastructure part, I think is something that we, we've been thinking about, but we can 
yeah. we can put some definition and, around that. In some yeah. of the stations, you might find that if they get a creative retail person, they say, if we move this door and tweak this stairway mm -hmm. here, we can create 1,500 square feet of retail space here in existing For shell. Free, you know, yeah. Or, you know, just for whatever plumbing and wiring. Yeah. yeah. So, so, mm -hmm. so I'm understanding that you're not thinking that they would actually run the retail space. They're just going to provide for it and someone else is going to come in later. And But then how would they know, how would we know whether that's marketable or that's the maximum mark? That 1,500 square feet is in the right place. If you just tweaked it, it would have been a whole lot better, mm -hmm. but they don't care because they're not going to you know, enjoy the profits of that space. So what we're going to be left with an unusable mm -hmm. space in the worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just came back from, uh, over the summer, we looked at uh, one of these new uh, park and ride stations on the Seattle, the uh, a Angel Lake Station, Angle Lake Station, which is actually a LEED certified. But they have a retail space in one of their parking garages, which it's empty, and probably for that reason. Yeah, so that a is a point. consideration. I mean, you're going to pay for the cost, right? I presume it's a little extra on the hard costs. But if you don't have the retail solution that follows, then we have to pay for infrastructure improvements that we can't get any return back. Yeah. Where's that Angel Lake Park and Ride? Uh, it's the next one down from the station, SeaTac. SeaTac. Yeah, it's the, the oh, yes. most recent one. So that's, that's one reason why, you know, talking with market people about where there's, you know, this is not rocket science. If you build it in places that people are already walking right. to and fro the station, there might be customers. If it's people who are driving, they're probably not going to shop there. You know, so. Madam Chair, I do have one more request. Go ahead. I, this will be quick. Go ahead. So one of the ones we haven't talked about is Middle Street. Mm -hmm. And I just want people to know that DTS, at least, is taking a second look at that because we're under a directive from city council to convert to 100% uh, no emission yeah. mm -hmm. bus fleet, which changes everything in terms of the maintenance spaces. No longer you're dealing with fuels and leaks mm -hmm. and all that kind of good stuff. And there are places where they have provided for continuation of the bus uh, maintenance facility, but developing the rights over it. Yep. Uh, so we're, we're going to take another look at that, and we can do that independently, but you should include that when you're PowerPoint. I think yeah. the EY report kind of tossed that aside, and I think uh, we should we should bring it back into the list yeah, of it, things. It's, it's in the overall as a long-term potential, but it you know because it didn't have didn't make the near-term list because uh, you know you've got all your bus facilities there. It would be very expensive to to move yeah. them in the next five years. So, Wes, there's a uh, a much more the 137 page um, yeah. <laughs> presentation from EY that does yeah. include Middle Street. We didn't yeah. bring all of it in. We just brought in the ones primarily today for Hart that was Hart acquired mm -hmm. property, which was serendipitous. I mean, we only have these acres and because they had to condemn a larger part for mm -hmm. reasons that had to do with building the rail and not for reasons of developing TOD. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but the middle street is city land, city yep. acquired. So we didn't have a, we didn't, and we can bring in more discussion on the city TOD, city um, properties. Um, we touched only on mm -hmm. certain ones, but middle street is certainly part of it. Um, before you go, Harrison, I think what I'd like you to do for the next meeting mm -hmm. is have some analysis of the Ala Moana, if you could do that. Is that, if that's possible with the Watermill project? Uh, Maybe? At staff level by then, we'll see if we can get the consultants okay. All right. engaged. And there's one suggestion that Murphy made um, uh, in his memo to <clears throat> us, which I wanted somebody to look in, and he said if there was any um, CDBG possibility. I can't, off the top of my head, I couldn't think of too much of the guideway that went through CDBG <coughs> eligible areas except for Waipahu. Um, Chinatown. I don't think Chinatown is CDBG. Uh, I mean, it used to be because all of the properties over there were CDBG. But if it's if it's Chinatown, then it would also be Kalihi. But can someone look into that to see whether yep. there are possible CDBG sources of funding for projects that we might want to look at for purposes mm -hmm. of our TOD with yeah, city sure. acquired land or SART acquired land? Okay, if you can. Yeah. So the question is whether we should look at. CDBG helping to um, bolster the yes. cost. Yes. Okay, just again, what 
was talked about earlier, when you federalize a project for right. it comes right. with more mm -hmm. requirements. Right. right. Plus Harbor, you know, Harbor Court is CDBG. Is CDBG, right. Mm -hmm. So right. there's an, and also I should mention that Middle Street is also federalized, but Again, oh, different we're, with that, we're with finding that out in these federal programs, yeah. which you couldn't do yeah. five, ten years right. ago, is a little bit easier right. to do these days. Right. But keeping in mind with CDBG, all the projects that the city is under fire on were projects that were given out as grants, not city projects. Yep. I mean, like the Hula Fire Station, that's a city project. And we can con city can control the project and the spending. They can't control the nonprofits that try to, that don't get enough money or financing to build whatever they're supposed to build so yep. okay so but if someone can look at that because that was actually a really good idea that i hadn't mm -hmm. thought about and yep. i should have <laughs> yeah I, we, we we did look at cd potential yeah. three or four years ago and there is there's more than one area that is okay you know, and so i'd like a report on that um well, going back to your your question as to what uh direction or request we might have for uh, Andy, Ryan, and staff as you look at this. You know, I'm sort of struck here uh, by uh, what a lost opportunity overall there was when, when the idea of doing rail, moving forward with this project first started. You know, I mean, easy, you know, hindsight, of course, being what it is, nonetheless, it, it seems to me that, uh, you know, when we started this thing, the, the, the planners of this should have been thinking that, you know, we're not just building a rail, we're building a TOD should have been, along with P3, should have been, uh, you know, a large part of the thinking consideration. It is as it is. But my, so my, my, my suggestion or recommendation or request to the extent reasonable and practicable for you guys when you come back, because again, this is, this is you know, I, I'm coming in as a complete novice to the TOD other than what I saw from uh, attending Revolution and seeing the possibilities about TOD. And I understand without knowing the exact details that there are going to be some great limitations as to what can be done to actually work and develop things uh, because of budget issues, redesign issues, things that should have been or could have been taken care of without any problem built into the system way back when if we were starting all over again. But that's what I would ask you actually to do, which is to say, you know, you can, you can look at uh, this in, I think, a couple of ways. One way would be to say, okay, we have these limitations in mind. This is all we can do for TOD, right? Now let's just focus on that, and then maybe in some ways that would be a simple thing, but I think we'd also miss out on some other opportunities. So what I would suggest is that or request to say, if you were doing this all over again, what would we be doing, right? And then, and then we can work backwards into saying, okay, well, can't do that, can't do that. But at least we'll know what the possibilities are, and God knows in the middle of it all we may say, well, that's something we wouldn't have considered. But you know something, it wouldn't cost that much actually to work this now into the plant. That's all I suggest, because yeah. it's kind of like building a house. If you say, okay, I'm going to remodel this thing, and generally, again, there's a lot more to do remodeling than tearing it down and rebuilding. But, you know, I mean, if you're thinking in terms of what you wish you had, um, you can get, it seems to me, it's easier to get to, you figure out a lot more things that you could incorporate than if you start on the other end saying, well, what can we actually work with? You know what I mean? And I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned, on the eight city center stations, we can take that approach it's not too late and just so you don't think all hope is lost i give you one example uh vancouver skytrain mm -hmm. uh was developed in the 80s mm -hmm. and the approach there was cookie cutter stations to mm -hmm. keep costs down they've since in recent years redesigned and redeveloped many of their stations mm -hmm. for the same reasons we're talking well, about uh, they mm -hmm. wanted the stations to be more lively activity centers and they had a whole program to go back and mm -hmm. change the cookie cutter into and what clear, they now envision. So. I haven't given up. I just want to make sure <laughs> that at this point in time, when we're now actually saying, "Hey, you know, that was a good idea," that we don't um, we don't miss anything that we mm -hmm. should be thinking right, about right. or not include yeah. in future plans when the opportunity right. arises again, yeah. because we're limiting what right. we think we can do. And as Harrison mentioned. The, the private sector is already taking actions in adjacent areas, right? 
Yeah. So it's not as if nothing's happening, yeah. even, even though we may have missed some opportunity within the station boundaries. And those are being coordinated with, with HART to, for connectivity. So we may, we may not, um, more positively, we may not be on the board by then, but we should be taking collective diaries so that these things are remembered when we do the extensions yep. into Kapolei City, to Waikiki, to the university. Those considerations should be remembered and we can plan accordingly. Absolutely. Yep. Anything else? Great. Good discussion. Thank you very much. We need to uh, Oh, yeah, I can't continue. Can I continue? Oh, you want to continue? For a date undecided, undetermined? Date certain. Just talk for a minute. Yeah. Okay. Motion to adjourn, anyone? So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> All in favor? Yes, we're adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.